Thank you so much. I guess I don't have to introduce myself, which is great. It's so nice to see so many faces that I recognize and love, and, um, and so many faces that I don't yet. Thanks for being here, um, especially because it's Creative Mornings. And I'm here to talk about education, schools. And it's not something that we normally associate with creativity or creative people, right? Is there anyone in this room who actually loved school? Raise your hand, both hands. Oh, wow. <laughs> There's at least six of, out of 200 and odd people. Uh, well, that makes six of us. Um, for creative people, school is torture most of the time because for the most part, it's a place where you fill your head, um, not where you express ideas. It's a place where you learn facts and get tested on them periodically. Um, and if you're not the academic type, it's hard to feel successful at school, isn't it, sometimes? Yeah. Um, if you're interested in drawing or art or computers or dance, then those are hobbies and they're supposed to be done after school, right? After you get an education, that's not part of your education. Anyway, don't get me started on that. Uh, I'll talk about me instead. I'll talk about, um, did I ever tell you the story about three condoms and one annoying question? It's a good one. Um, the story is um, the one I chose because it defines creativity for me. It starts the day I was conceived. You know, everybody starts the day they're born. I thought, I'll start a little sooner, get a head start. Uh, my mom always said to me, you know what? The day you were conceived, we used three condoms. And here you are. It's unbelievable. It's a miracle. She was thrilled. My dad, not so much. Uh, they were, he was so young. They were 21 and married. And he thought they'd have years ahead of marital bliss before all of this. But here I came. And for me, the story made it really clear that I had superhuman qualities, uh, one of which being uh, uh, persistence. Persistence defined my existence. Eventually, I found out my mom had kind of omitted a few details from the story. Um, they weren't, you know, they were young and also they used to wash their condoms and to save money. So that's... <laughs> But by the time I found out, I'd already lived most of my life knowing I was the persistent kind. And so that was definitely a trait of mine, my first. The second trait that defined my existence was one annoying question. Why not? It exasperated everyone. To this day, it exasperates everyone, but I couldn't help it. I was a huge innovator. I, if there was something to fix or something that I could make better, I would just think, well, why not? Why not make it better? Um, so being persistent, imagine, on top of it, didn't help matters. Because for years, I tried to solve the same problem. Uh, for example, one time when I was little, we used to live in Montreal, and um, we used to sleep. It was in Montreal, it was cold, it was a 100-year-old house, and. Um, we used to sleep with socks on, pajamas, sheets, and very thick, pure wool blankets. And it was so uncomfortable, so uncomfortable. At night, you'd be sleeping, and the sheets would like wrap around you and tangle you up and take your socks off and finally just throw you out of bed, and you just wake up and get out of bed in the freezing cold, have to remake your bed, which is no fun when you're eight years old, right? And then put it all together again, climb back into bed, um, thaw, because you're frozen by that time, and then go back to sleep by yourself in the dark. So I thought this is, is not working for me. 
And I decided that maybe I would sleep without the sheet. So I would just sleep with my, with my blanket. And that was so much better, infinitely better, until my mom found out. What are you doing? Where's your sheet? Oh, I, I don't sleep with a sheet anymore. Why not? Well, I can't, I can't sleep with it. It's so uncomfortable. Anyway, there's less laundry to do. Well, you can't sleep with no sheets. Why not? Well, you can't. You just can't sleep with no sheets. You just can't. And stop asking questions. It's just stop talking back. Just sleep with your sheets on. Nobody doesn't sleep with their sheets on. And I thought, okay, well, why not? That didn't go over well. So what I did was I still made my bed with the sheets, and then at night I would just put the sheet to a side and continue with my brilliant plan of just sleeping with a blanket. Until finally, my grandma patiently explained to me that the reason why you put a sheet on is because blankets, unlike sheets, can't be washed if they're pure wool. And because they can't be washed, the oils in your body rub on the blanket and then they make them stinky and, and you just, you can't do that. And that I understood. And from that day on, I said, okay, fine, I'll sleep with the sheets. And I never went back to my original plan. I just suffered through it until one day when I was 19 years old, I slept at a friend's house who had a washable duvet cover. <laughs> I mean, somebody didn't like sheets just like me and somebody was even more persistent than me and found a creative solution to the problem. And that's just my point. Creativity for me, and, and Mark, maybe you will agree or maybe disagree with me, but it's a way of thinking. It's a different way of looking at things. It's in everything you do. It's a habit. As much as I'd love to tell you, though, that my story is very special, it's not. Maybe not everybody was born out of three condoms, but everybody is creative, <laughs> at least as a child. Anyone who's ever had time to spend with a two-year-old will tell you that they are definitely persistent, right? Are they? Who has a two-year-old? Anyone? Three, four, five, any child? Well, a few of you. Okay, and, and if not, you have friends who have friends. Any child that you know who's young is very persistent and also their favorite question, just like me, is either why or why not. It just makes sense. So if every child is creative, why isn't every adult? What happens? Well, school happens and parents. <laughs> parents don't really mean to, they just don't have the patience for it. Um, well, they get tired of constant questions, they get confused between creativity and art artistic talent, and then let's face it, creative thinking is a huge nuisance in a parent's life. Isn't it? Who's a parent? Isn't it a pain? It really is. I mean, it's unexpected. <laughs> Definitely. That is a cell phone, by the way, not a sponge. It's <laughs> unexpected. It's infuriating. <laughs> infuriating. It's inconvenient when you're running to the supermarket and all of a sudden your child sees a puddle. It was a creative way of looking at a puddle, but it definitely didn't help. It's dangerous or even illegal. And then children go to school for 12 years, where the arts take second place to academics, where mistakes are a bad thing, and where there's no time to debate, challenge, or for even for innovation. So eventually, Creativity shrivels up in our brains. You see, the thing is, all of you are creatives and, and you're probably wondering, what is she doing here? However, you and I have something in common after all. Our creativity took a beating at school, but it survived. We had just a tiny chance and we made it. That's amazing. I mean, it's a miracle, my mom would say. I mean, look at you. You are creatives, creatives, that's your career. Imagine that, I mean, wow, congratulations to you. And me, believe it or not, I still became a teacher. I always wanted to be a teacher. Um, I was telling you before that I love school. It was six of us in here who love school, remember? And um, I uh, became an elementary school teacher and then I specialized in early learning. I love teaching. I love it so much that every child in my class loved it as well. They loved coming to school every day, every year, without exception, any class, any age. Um, children loved it because they felt passion. They felt so excited. They felt purpose, a sense of purpose for being there. Um, 
And it was just fun to spend the day together doing stuff and learning. And people say, oh, well, maybe because you were fun, they didn't learn. Oh, they learned. I was a straight A student and I just demanded it you know, of myself, it wasn't my parents. Um, I just decided that if I could do better, I'll do better. And so there's no question that the children in my class also had to study hard and be passionate about it. If you're going to do it, then do it well. Um, so I take my learning seriously. But you can learn and not suffer through it. You don't have to choose between learning and fun or between, you know, creativity and learning. Um, the same as you can be creative and be not, not be good at drawing. It doesn't have, you know, those two things don't have to go together. And so I started working for schools, all kinds of schools, and then I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if schools were different? Uh, because there's only so much that you can push, right? And say, well, how about da dance class? Well, not really, it's not in our curriculum. Oh, how about drama? Okay, not you again. Oh, how about this? Well, just stop, go back to your classroom, keep going. And so finally I said, oh, you know, it would be so great if I had a school I would have the world standards in, in uh, academics. It, but it would be tailored to each child. It wouldn't be that, oh, everybody, you know, learn the same way, and if you fall above or below the 60th percentile, then you're just not meant for school. I didn't want to also just uh, learning, I didn't want children to just learn to write uh, without spelling errors. I wanted them to use that writing, to just use that skill to write stories, to talk about themselves, to express themselves. Um, just like I did when I was their age. And the same for every other discipline, reading, math, science, learn it and love it with a passion, even if it's not your thing. That meant that children would need to be in control of their learning and really experience it, not just get lectured. They'd need to figure things out, think about it, try again, make mistakes, learn from that, give it another try. You know how it goes, very creative process. It would have to have an amazing arts program where children would really learn about themselves, what they like, what makes them feel good, what makes them move, what makes them happy, learn from the inside out. Find out who they are through the creative process. And of course, it wouldn't just include visual arts. The school had to have dance, it had to have music, drama, cooking, yoga and relaxation, of course, the works. Plus, lots of time for fun, because what's the point, right? You're there with 20 of the most amazing people, they're all your age, and you don't have time to even talk together. Then what's the point of spending eight hours at school? Uh, so you had to have time to make friendships, and friendships that you could keep for years and years. Um, time to eat together, of course, that's really important. We spend every noon hour together, every lunchtime together, and so, and no ham sandwich. We needed to do something better. So the school, unfortunately, would have to have a chef. It was just a requirement because then we would eat healthy. We could have vegetarian um, menus that included something other than cream and cheese sandwiches for school. Uh, and then the school would immerse children in different cultures because look at our world today. We're not just the one country. We have internet, right? So we're connected. Uh, so we'd have to learn about different cult uh, cultures, cultivate empathy in children, right from a very young age, inclusion, peace. It would introduce children to the world and encourage them to participate. Show them that they're needed and that they are expected to contribute. Not when they turn 18, right now. What is it that you can do right now? What ideas do you have? So the school I wanted didn't exist. And I thought, why not? Why can't it be? It can't be that hard to build. I mean, it's just wanting to do it and doing it. So I built it. It wasn't that easy. I'm just making it sound easy. But anyway, I built it and I had everything I wanted, including the chef. I called it CIFA for Core Education and Fine Arts. I based its curriculum on the highest world standards, added dance, arts, drama, projects, time for play, time for everything you wanted. Uh, then I designed a training program for our teachers because you can't use the same teachers who are not teaching in a creative way to teach in a creative school. So we did this whole training program where they would learn to understand the child and to teach something with excitement, with passion, with everything they have inside of them. Um, and today, after 15 years, we have 12 CIFA schools that are open, another six that are coming up, and 
they were all built by parents who wanted the same thing, who felt giddy about learning and education, who wanted to give children that in their communities. So I said I would give you my opinion on education and creativity. And my opinion is this. All schools can and must be creative environments. They have to. There's no reason why they shouldn't. The topic of today's Creative Mornings is reuse. And I'm very proud of myself because I'm not talking about recycling. Um, it, is, um, it couldn't be more fitting to my topic because it's important that we as teachers stop. Before dumping knowledge into our children's heads, we have to think, how can they reuse this in their lives? How is that going to be beneficial? How can this make them a better human being? How can it give them the tools to navigate the future? And you'll find that anything, anything creative, has a deeper purpose, um, a greater reusable value the um, much greater than facts. Facts they can get on a calculator or at the library. They can read it on a book. Both are very important. Academic skills are really important and a curriculum is important. That's our introduction to the world. It's what tells us this is where you're at, this is everything that's happened before you, right? Until this day. But one is essential and that is creativity. Because all the facts in the world won't be enough to solve the complex problems that are facing us today and in the future. We need creative minds. We need innovators. We need thinkers. And the reason we don't have more creative people like you is largely because of the schools. At CFF, we focus on the early years because that's where Canada is really behind. But don't be mistaken. We can do the exact same thing with an elementary school, with a high school, with any school out there. I mean, think about it. If CFA can teach a two-year-old to write, and they're itching to get to school the next morning, and they sleep in their uniforms just to run out, then any teacher can take, can take a class of 10-year-olds and teach them math and arts and make it exciting and relevant. There's no excuse for it. Creativity is a habit that must be cultivated. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, who thinks they have the best killer? Okay, Todd Smith, hand up. Look at that. Okay, the only other guy in the room with a tie on. Here, can someone? Um, so the question our group came up with was, uh, I mean, what you're doing is great, uh, but we thought, what's the best way to bring this type of thinking to BC schools? And What's the best way to include governmental bodies in distributing this a little bit wider? Um, and I guess the first question would be one to the audience is, is there a representation of BC schools or schooling in general? Teachers, I realize it's past nine on a weekday, but what's the best way to integrate creativity and different thinking into public schools moving forward? That's a really good question and one that I've focused on for as long as I've had the schools, actually for longer, I think it's been 20 years that I've been lobbying the government for a couple of things. One is creativity in schools, and two is, um, is a, a good early learning program. I haven't touched on this um, today, because there's only so much you can talk about, but I focus on the early learning uh, years, uh, not children younger than five, because that's when uh, most of our brain development takes place, and that's where most of our programs are lacking. Having said that, I think with the government, it's, um, what's difficult is that every time there's a new election, things change. I cannot tell you how many times I have been to, uh, I've been invited to forums and hundreds of thousands of dollars have been spent flying us to you know, that place and meals and everything. And then we would discuss things, we would all come up with a plan and then I would be the one, oh, so what's going on, what's going on, what's going on? And then just to find out that that position no longer existed or somebody went on mat leave or then you know, another government took and, and what happens is all of that work gets tossed out and the new committee gets formed with their own ideas. But four years, believe it or not, is not a long, long time to do, you know, to change the entire educational system. 
I happen to think that I'm very practical about, thing, about things, and I think, well, if we do all of this and we cost the same as a daycare, uh, we actually cost less because we have to pay for everything, whereas childcare is sponsored um, by other subsidies such as rent and things like that. If we do all this, why can't schools do the same? Add the arts, add you know drama, add music, um, add all this um, for the same price. It's just a way of thinking, and that's what I think we're lacking. Another thing that I, uh, so in response, and just to answer your question, I think that yes, government should get involved. I think what happens also is that for government to change anything, they need proof. They need to know that it works, and they need to see it happen in Canada first. So you need to have somebody like me, for example, who will open the school, run it for a while, then get the government to test their students, <laughs> again, test their students, make sure that the program works, and then implement it. That's years you know, uh, in the making. We're doing that, uh, and I think that once we've proven it for the younger years, then it can be applied to the older years. I mean, it's so much easier to do with older students. They're almost, you have the facilities, you have everything. Um, and I do think that we need to uh, train our teachers differently as well. So the, the Ministry of Education definitely has to be involved, and uh, we have to agree on continuing this process um, throughout the different governments as well, because <laughs> otherwise it's a bit waste of uh, time and money for all of us. Does that answer your question? Anybody? Is that it? We're done? Shall we go? Oh. Hi. Um, how do you find your students integrate into the regular school system once they're done with you? Um, and do a lot of them go into the regular school system, or do they end up in other private private schools? Uh, after after CIFA, children tend to, it depends on the parents. Not everybody you know, can afford private school. And, and, and uh, to be honest with you, sometimes there is no difference between a private school and a public school. It really depends on the private school. In fact, it really depends on the principle of the school. You can have an amazing principle with all the energy in the world, and that principle will make a tremendous difference to that school, to the teachers, uh, whereas you can have, you know, you can change principles and four years later you don't recognize that school. Um, having said that, I always tell the parents, well, you have a choice. You can give your child the amazing start that they can have, and then, you know, struggle as a parent to keep up a little bit once they get to school, or you can just not teach them anything, dumb them down a little bit, dumb them down just to make sure that they fit into school and that they're not bored. Smart children are never bored. Um, and creative people are hardly ever bored because you find a creative avenue <laughs> or you find something else to do, right? Uh, it's difficult to sit for eight hours straight. Many, many schools, and I was happy to hear uh, going through the audience that some of you had uh, different experiences at, um, at school, and many schools offer creativity. Um, there's programs that also help you um, challenge, for example, the IB program gets you to think more than our regular school uh, curriculum. I think that um, creative children after my school will, you know, they will take up an instrument or those, and we teach our parents what to do at home as well so that the, to, to make sure that they continue being creative and that they're, they're really enjoying their time. But my recipe for creativity is really giving children time off, <laughs> really, because you don't need to be told what to do in order to be creative, right? That's, that's when you have the time off is when you get, so you need the inspiration and then you need the time to go for it. So it's not harder. It actually is easier for children when, when they have that spark. Before I get the next question, I have a request from the video team. Yes. Could you move like t 12 inches to your right? Oh, wait, in the light. Oh yeah, that's good, right there. No, 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 because if you're in front of the screen, we're seeing words on your face. And oh. we want to see your face. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Who has another question? Okay. Who are you, stranger? I'm Matt, Mark. So uh, just curious, because you're saying kind of what you were doing from a parent's perspective, is there something, you know, with an interest for those, those programs to continue, is there something from a parental perspective that we'd be able to do to, you know, either suggest to the government or, you know, to enhance? My second part of that is, is um, 
do you provide, you, you mentioned that you work with parents to ensure that that happens kind of from a home perspective as well. Do you do that outside of the kids that actually go to your school? Great question. Yes, it's my hobby. <laughs> I love it. Um, once a month, approximately, or twice a month, I have talks that are at my schools, at any of my schools. So if you go on our website, you'll see that we have... Um, you'll see that there's a calendar of talks. And what that is, is a forum for parents. And any parent from the community is invited. It's not just for CIFA parents. And we, we teach things like, okay, well, what, for example, we, debated, uh, we talked about, you know, why over-preparing your children learns to... Uh, leads to under-prepared adults. And what, what, you know, so depending on the parents' topics and what they want to learn and do is what we will discuss. Um, so definitely I have to, you know, there's a lot of work to be done as far as uh, discussing what, how to keep your children creative at home, what can, what can you do instead of, you know, 700 different co-curricular activities after school, why it's not always a good idea to get a tutor, all of, all of those things. So definitely we have a, a very strong community of parents at CIFA and I'm really happy to see that that's my contribution, I guess, to the community is I, I, anything I know I want to share. So any parent from any age, I have teenagers myself, so it's, I love that age, love it, love it. So any questions, any parents, anything that they're interested in doing towards, you know, uh, bettering the education system, improving the education system, I'm always there and I always stay after the talks to talk about anything else. So if you're wondering where to start, this would be a good place. I'll, I'll meet you at any of our schools. Can we just all give you our kids? Pardon? Can we just all give you our kids? And oh, then you give them I back later that. when they're 20? <laughs> You have to talk to Alex first. <laughs> I keep saying, well, can't we take one more child with 700 more children? And he's like, yeah. But How about yeah. the back couple rows? You look like smart people. There's one. Ooh. Hi. Uh, I'm curious, in the same way that a traditional school might alienate um, you know, creative kids who just can't handle all that structure, have you found that there's kids in your school who just really want structure and don't like the freedom you give them and all that route for creativity? A great question. And I think that that's, it's a, again, it's creativity, like I said, it's a, it's a way of thinking, right? It doesn't mean that you're running around wild painting on the walls. Sometimes you are, but uh, there is a lot of structure to it. And children love that. They like to know that, you know, after breakfast, we read books. And after this, we do that. They like the predictability of things. Um, it's the, a chaotic environment won't help anybody. Uh, but I think the main difference is in empowering children to make their own decisions as much as they can. And, and that goes for school too. So let's say we're teaching math. And so the teacher comes up and says, hey, who wants to play this game? We're gonna do this and this and this. And it's all a math game and the puppets come out and everything. The child can say, yeah, that's fun, but I don't wanna do that. I wanna do this other thing. Well, little do they know that our teachers actually prepared all of the games in the classroom to be related to some of our math um, curriculum. So all of them will teach them just in a different way. We'll teach them a, a similar concept, but the child is in charge of what they want to do. And it's very easy. I've worked in an elementary school. It's really a lot easier to do that with older children where you say, okay, we're gonna study this and how do we do it? And the group gets organized. You have a space in the back where there's a chess table and there's all kinds of other activities. You give them option of how they want to learn. Some of them love to listen to you. Some of them will love to debate. And so I think that when we think creativity, we automatically think all oh, this excess freedom. Children should be free to learn math the same way as they're free to learn art. It's what comes out of you that's important. It's not so much how you structure, um, you know, all the, fr the freedom means freedom of choice, not so much, well, let's do whatever. So that's where I find we have no problems at all. In fact, our children are very, uh, you know, after four years with us, they're <laughs> very structured, they know exactly, and they go to the class and they go, oh, I know, because they're so familiar uh, with, the, with the rhythm of school and everything, so it looks the same as a classroom, they go year after year, just like a, in an elementary school, but when they get to school, they just, they have all the questions, they want to in interact with the teacher, they want to interact with their friends, because they're used to that, that's normal for them, it's just a very healthy environment. And there's no reason why we can't do that, like I said, in elementary schools, and you can teach Math, you can teach art and dance. I mean, look at dance. What ballerina do you know 
um, just runs around the stage and you know you've got to have structure you have to have discipline and and it, it's it, so creativity is both mastering a discipline right even an instrument you can be a really creative piano player but you've got to master piano you can't just I am not a creative piano player right I could just bang around and at some keys and so that's it's it's the mastering of that it's the inner discipline that it takes which we also learn from academics, but we also should learn from art. And at the same time, the freedom to make it happen in your own way, to give it your own voice and your own inner passion. And that's when you learn the most. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thanks. All I got out of that, to be you know, honest, we're friends, is this. <laughs> uh, got the back. Uh, I don't think, uh, we've had two good ones here. I'm gonna go over there and I'm gonna come back to you, okay? Here we go. Merv Griffin, Merv Griffin, Merv Griffin. Hello, Jen here. Hi. Um, so Blue Sky, all of our kids and the next generation of kids start you know, having this kind of education. What does uh, society, what does this community, um, what does it look like day to day if we have a whole new generation of people educated in this creative process? What does that look like to you? Well, imagine. <laughs> Imagine. I mean, I think that when you are when you are given creativity and you're given that freedom right from a very young age, um, you also give them the expectation. Um, you know how they say, it, "Great freedom comes great responsibility." You give them the expectation that, like I said earlier, that they contribute to the world. Right? You now you've discovered through school. You you've learned about the world. That's my vision anyway. You go to school to learn about the world. You discover through who you are in the process. And from that, you discover what, what you want to give. So you have children who are empathetic. You, are, you have children who are involved. I'll give you an example. Um, our, when, remember um, when there was the earthquake in Haiti uh, a few years ago? Um, our children, of course, the parents of our children have all children younger than four years of age or five years of age, so they didn't speak to their children about what had happened in Haiti, but guess what? They all knew. They all had heard somehow because it was everywhere. It was on everybody's lips. So they got to school all stressed out. What can we do? Not what can we do, but what, what's happening? And nobody wanted to tell them, so what happens when nobody wants to tell you? You think it's way worse than it actually is. And so we talked about it at school. We said, well, this is what happened. There was an earthquake. We figured out what an earthquake was, all of us together, from the two-year-olds to the four-year-olds. And then one of the children had the idea of uh, rebuilding Haiti and how we illustrated that with them. And it was a child's idea. They said, well, let's, what does it take to rebuild a city, right? When a city is in, in shambles, when there's nothing left, how do you rebuild it? They grabbed the Lego, put all these pieces, rubble, uh, on a platform and they said, okay, well, you know, what we can do is just, we will get some money to get the building supplies, we'll get everything. So they put a jar next to the Lego, rubble, and every time they brought, they went and sold bottles, they did all kinds of things by themselves to earn money, put it in a jar, and every time they put any money in a jar, be it one cent or 25 cents, it didn't matter to children, they don't know the value of money, they got to put, they got to build one piece. Soon enough, they had a house, then they had a school that they built, then they had all the buildings, and they built this entire Lego city, and that represented their change, how much they were helping. We actually raised a ton of money for Haiti, and we gave it all to the Red Cross, because we have many schools, so when we start to make a change, it really impacts um, you know, the, change that we want, the, the, the change we want to make. And I think that when a child is creative, a creative thinker, that will help that child come up with solutions that they face to, the, that, to problems that they face, that we all face in the world. And that's what I think, don't you sometimes feel powerless um, when things happen? You think, well, you know, what difference can I make? You can make a difference. And it doesn't matter how little. I know that I'm not changing the world with 12 schools, but hey, I think it should be that way and let's do it. So when you empower children and you give them the, the responsibility that goes with the freedom, you can see a world that is much more empathetic, um, a world that is able to solve things and is proactive. And that's, you know, it's about time that we have that. Whereas what you have now is people who are entitled. They just think, oh, mom and dad gave me everything. The school is teaching me what I need to know. And when I go to work, nobody, no child without being taught this, um, is going to think, oh, well, what can I do? You know, what should I do? They're not, it's a habit. The same as when, you know, 
when my children go to come home, I expect them to ask me how my day was, not just their day. Uh, well, I had a day too, I want to talk about it. And so the same, <laughs> well, I make their milk when they come back from school, but they also cook me dinner sometimes, right? That's, that's, and you, as a parent, you have to help your children contribute to your family and to the world, to the community, to everything. And not just by donating money, by actually rolling up their sleeves and doing something. That's creativity to me. Awesome. You, you buy a token, you walk out of the restaurant, and if, and, and if you find someone on the street that's living in poverty or have, you know, down on their luck, a fringe, fringe person that we often ignore, and a lot of people, and I understand this, a lot of people refuse to give money to people on the street who ask for money, right? Everyone has an opinion, that's fine, I'm not judging. Why don't you give them a token, and they can go to Save on Meats, and they get a meal for two twenty-five. Can I tell them the next thing that's coming up? Okay, so just today, I guess we're announcing, we're sort of new, it's out, people know about it? So this is, so nobody knows. This is like a world, a world premiere. Whoa, where's the music indeed? So there's a new token program starting a month from now for socks. So a token, how much are the tokens? That's TBD. TBD. Wow, so you get a token, you find someone in need, and you give them a pair of socks and a meal. Isn't that wicked? Okay, so I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to wrap up with that and say thank you for coming. Um, we have, you can give them to me, give them to me. I have 50 tokens for y'all to give to people as you leave. There's, no, there's about 200 of you. Thanks, pal. Ooh, fancy package. Okay. I feel like I just did a drug deal with, with Brand. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, right on, right on, dude. Uh, so I have 50 meals. Um, I'm going to stand on stage and hand them out to the first 50 people that come and say hello and shake my hand. Thank you very much. Have a great day and a creative weekend. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much. My pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you.